In this video, I am going to take some time to respond to subscriber questions that have been sent in to me. If you're curious what these questions are and what my answers might be, stay tuned for the video. Reggie here, your friendly neighborhood bodybuilder and comic book collector, and I want to welcome you to another one of my videos. In this video, I am going to spend some time responding to a host of subscriber questions that have been sent in to me on a variety of different topics. And none of my responses have been rehearsed, so I am literally going to be responding to them in the moment. And there are literally like three pages of questions in front of me from several subscribers. And I wanna just tell you who some of these folks are and then we're gonna dig into what their questions are and what my responses are. So we have questions from Sully Two Kings, Young Matthew, uh, Jonathan Michael, Doug, L. Smith, uh, Aram, I think that's how you say him, Warren, Joker, Mark, Yoshi, and a host of other people. So with that, uh, there's a lot of questions. Let's go ahead and get started. Uh, the first question comes from my man, Sully Two Kings, and his question to me uh, was, we have three big comic publishers, Marvel, DC, and Image. What comic company do you think is on the horizon to be the next big publisher and why? Uh, what I would say to Sully Two Kings and anyone else that is thinking about this is that in my mind, I feel like Boom Studios probably is the next big publisher out there. And I say that because if memory serves, and it's been a while since I've looked at these numbers, if memory serves, they are like the fourth largest, if you will, publisher out there in terms of sales of comic books into the market. But more maybe importantly than that, I think that the quality of the content that Boom Studios is putting out right now is impressive. It really is an impressive display. Um, they have, what is it? Um, you only find them when they're dead. Uh, the Unkindness of Ravens. Uh, those are just two titles that readily come to my mind that are really awesome to read. And, and I'm probably, again, not thinking about the full list of those Boom Studios titles that I actually read and enjoy, but there is there is a long list of them out there. So if, if I had to pick one, it would probably be Boom Studios because technically they are next in line but also with the quality of work that they are putting out, it makes sense that they be identified as a publisher that is on the rise. And then there's all of the other indies out there, a lot of other indies that are putting out some really great content as well, but Boom Studios, Sully Two Kings is the one that I would identify. Young Matthew is asking a question here. He says, do you think it's healthy to take breaks when collecting to prevent collector's fatigue if so, what do you recommend is a good time span for a break from collecting? I'm actually going to answer this in a couple of different ways. What I would say is that no matter what someone is engaged in, I think that it is healthy to take a break from those activities. So if, if you are someone that, that lifts weights or runs, it's great to have a break from those activities because that's when your body is able to recover. That's when growth actually happens. If you work a lot, it is nice to take a, a, a vacation so that you can have a mental break and actually have some recovery. When it comes to comic collecting, yes, this is an enjoyable activity, but any activity that you engage in on a regular and consistent basis sometimes requires a little bit of a break. I do videos here on YouTube and I will tell you that sometimes in the middle of a week and sometimes for an entire week, I will actually take a break. And, and people may not realize that uh, because I'm constantly releasing videos, but a lot of times I pre-record videos and I will release those that are in my inventory so that I can actually take a, a step away from the channel and actually recharge. 
and even midweek, I'll not go live for like an entire week in order to actually put a little bit of space in there. Sometimes in a day, I won't even come into the comic book room because I need a break or I won't read comics. Now, how long should someone take a break? It depends upon the person and it depends upon how that person chooses to recharge their energies. And so I think that every person is different. Every person has to decide what type of break they actually need. Is it a day? Is it a week? Is it a month? I honestly could not begin to tell you because every one of us recharges differently. Each one of us has a different type of work ethic. Um, and so I think it's up to each person to, to decide. Uh, next question comes from uh, Jonathan. And his question, he says, uh, I've been a collector since the 80s, but took a break in between. I have some key books from Hulk 181 to early X-Men titles. At the time, I only collected raw books. My question is, since I already own them, should I submit them in for grading or at what point should someone decide to do so? This is a complicated question because it is up to each individual to decide if getting comics graded is something that they want to do. Grading comics is not a requirement. It is not mandatory. It is not something that you have to do. So you have to decide if it's something that you want to do. Then you have to decide which grading company you want to go with. And you should choose the one that best meets your needs as a collector. And so if you need, you know, if you have a lot of books in your collection that are signed books, you may not want to go with CGC. If you want to have those books graded, you may want to go with CBCS. If you, if you like, you know, CGC, then you can do that. Maybe you send some books to CBCS. There's no wrong way to do it. It's really up to each individual to decide, you know, which grading company they want to go with if they decide that they want to get their books graded at all. When it comes to grading, I think that there is a couple of reasons why someone does it. Part of it is, is preservation, it's protection, and then there is the, the potential profit that can actually come from having graded comics. Honestly, again, going back to my very first point, you can literally just put your comics in Mylar or in a top loader and they will be perfectly fine, right? If, if you have peace of mind with that type of protection, go that route. If you are someone that wants to offer a little bit more physical protection to your books, then grading isn't a bad way to go. If you want to sell your books, one great way to extract the most value from those comics is by having them graded. And then there's no, no a question and there's no subjectivity associated with what is the value of this book because there are ample pricing guides out there that will tell you at each grade what the price is. So depending upon someone's needs and interests and desires, they can decide for themselves at what point, if any, do they actually get their comics graded. So uh, Jonathan, nothing wrong if you want to keep your comics raw. Nothing wrong with that at all. But if you want peace of mind and protection and profit and whatever it happens to be, grading is not a bad way to go. Which grading company? That's up to you to decide. And if you want to, um, if I remember, I will try to put some links in the description of this video that will actually help you to think through this a little bit more with some additional uh, thoughts that I have captured in other videos. Uh, Doug Bratton is asking the question of if I can tell the story of the best comic find in the wild. Uh, I actually have a lot of uh, finds in the wild and I say that because I do a lot of hunting or at least did a lot of hunting before Voldemort actually hit. Uh, but I would say probably one of my biggest scores to date uh, has been the the deal that I did at around 1030 at night behind a 7-Eleven in an apartment complex for books like Iron Man 55, um, Amazing Spider-Man um, 300 that went on to become a 9.6 that I had triple signed. Uh, and then a whole, I think it was um, Amazing Spider-Man 252 was in there. Uh, Amazing Spider-Man 301 and 302. I mean, th this collection that I was able to pick up, well, individual books from a collection, 
uh, there were a ton of really awesome books. And what's interesting about this, this story is that the Iron Man 55, for example, was actually found in a Ziploc freezer bag. This was a collection of, I think it was maybe four long boxes on a table in a living room that I was going through. And I was going through the Iron Man books and was like right up to Iron Man 55, it was missing, it wasn't there. And I continued to look through boxes and bins and lo and behold, in a Ziploc bag was Iron Man 55. I pull it out, I set it next to me, the guy's girlfriend who was doing her makeup on the sofa next to me just grabs the book and starts flipping through it and I'm cringing inside. <laughs> but that book, I ended up going on to buy it and getting it graded and it came back at a, at a pretty high grade. But I've had a lot of really awesome scores in the wild. Uh, the next question comes from L. Smith. Uh, he says, if you're like me and collecting as a kid or young adult, took a break from collecting, then returned to collecting as an adult who was financially in a totally different place from where we were as kids. How different is your collecting? Uh, I would say that, and he goes on here to say that, I know for me, I collected in the 80s and 90s and returned in 2018. There are a lot more genres now than I remember back then. My interests are wide and my pull list and my LCS is several pages long. So what I would say is, in many ways, my collecting habits aren't all that different from when I was a kid. There were some core uh, characters that I had an interest in. I remain interested in pretty much those same characters. At the time, there were some ancillary characters that I would be interested in, and, and I'm still interested in, in different types of ancillary characters. Maybe one of the biggest differences, not necessarily in my collecting, because that's pretty consistent, but in, in what I read, the books that I read now are much more diverse than they were in the past. In the past, I was Marvel. I didn't care about anything other than Marvel, other than maybe Image and Valiant, because they were really hot in the 90s when I was collecting. But outside of those, I didn't do much. Nowadays, I, I read Marvel and Image and Boom Studios and Ablaze and some TKO stuff and certainly some DC comics as well from all different ages. And, and I honestly enjoy all of those books. Um, to some degree or another, at some point, I will start to actually buy some more of those DC keys that, that, I've all, that I've wanted, if you will, but haven't necessarily picked up because I'm more focused on acquiring those Marvel books that I've always wanted since I was a kid. And so that's why I say my collecting hasn't really changed, but my reading habits and my interests are much more diverse than they were before. Um, there are a lot of genres out there and I honestly haven't really explored all of the genres because I'm still like a, a superhero spandex kind of guy. That is still quintessential to who I am as a collector and as a reader. And again, that's one thing that is a little unchanged. But shout out to, uh, to all of the folks that have submitted questions thus far, including L. Smith. Arams, I think that's Aram, uh, has submitted a question. He says, how would you pack your comics if you were moving to a different state? Uh, this is an easy one because I would not pack my comics uh, the same way that I hired a moving company to move the collection here, the 100K collection. I think that might be what he's talking about. I hired a moving company to move that collection for me and I helped them to unbox it. Uh, but when I move to a different state, it'll be pretty much the same thing. I will hire a moving company that will move my household belongings and then will also move my comic book collection as well. Uh, next up, Warren, I think hopefully that answers the question. Uh, Warren has a question here. He says, have you, and he had a lot to say, but I actually trimmed it back to the question. He says, have you ever heard of anyone collecting last issues or final issues of a series? Says something that he came up with um, a, a while ago. Uh, not sure if anyone else uh, aside from him has this type of unique approach. Any thoughts? So uh, what I would say is um, the great thing about comics is that there are lots of different ways that people can collect. Some people collect keys, some people collect first issues, some people collect first appearances, some people collect horror, some people like me, like spandex, some prefer Marvel and DC, some only want to collect things that Todd McFarlane has done or their favorite artist or their favorite creator has worked on. 
My point is that the great thing about this hobby in my mind is that you can collect whatever you want to collect and it doesn't matter. If it's relevant to you and important to you, then that's what makes it really awesome. I have never actually heard of anyone that collects just last issues, to be honest with you. Um, but just because I haven't heard of it doesn't mean that there's that's a wrong thing to do. And so what I would say, Warren, is if that is how you want to collect and enjoy this hobby, go for it. Nothing wrong with that at all. Uh, he goes on to ask a couple of questions in here. Um resources what let me see uh, uh or resources since figuring out how to combine ebay listings on what is lcs has for sale with actual listing so maybe what i think he's asking for is are there resources that can help him to identify last issues of comics my, my recommendation would be to check out um key collector app key collector app is a is a awesome resource i have it installed on my phone uh, it is great for helping you to identify the significance of, of books that are out there. And if a book happens to be scarce or if it happens to be the last issue in a title, that is oftentimes something that can be found in Key Collector App. So outside of that, I think you're on your own to kind of search uh, different resources to try to identify those last issues that uh, you may be hunting for. Um, Breakin is asking a question here. He says, um, thanks for the amazing videos. I'm back to collecting after a long hiatus. Uh, he says he feels overwhelmed with older keys, new books and keys and, and being inundated with speculation. What was my past experiences with these issues and what would be your advice to keeping focused on specific goals to attain the books that, you, that are really important to a new slash old collector. So I think that what Breakin is going through is very reminiscent probably of, of what each and every one of us has encountered. Most of us in this hobby, I think, uh, have taken various breaks at different periods. And Whenever you come back to a hobby, especially if a long period has time, as a long period of time has passed, you feel the need to catch up and you feel overwhelmed with the newness of things and, and potentially being in a, in a different financial place where now you can buy those books that you've always wanted. And, and so as someone that is newly back to something, everything is exciting. Everything is fresh. Therefore, you're everywhere. It's like you're looking for the shiny penny. You Shiny penny over there, shiny penny. You're going after it. And so as a result of that, you're watching all of the YouTube videos. You're following people on Instagram. You're on Facebook. You're, you're searching the internet, looking for this resource and that resource. You're going to the local comic shop. You're, you're doing everything because it's all fresh and new and exciting. And every one of us, has been through that. Every one of us has gotten caught up in FOMO and bought stuff that we really didn't need, that we didn't have an interest in. It's perfectly fine because we've all done it. The question is, how long do you let it go on before you say, wait a minute, this is not how I want to collect. This is not making me happy. And I think that that's where uh, he might be. And, and many of us have been there. One of the things that I always recommend, and, and you can find this in many different videos on my channel, I always recommend people create goals. They literally write out SMART goals, and it is specific, measurable, actionable. Uh, there's some kind of tangible results, and it's also time-bound, right? SMART goals, and you literally write it out. And so I'm a big fan of that because if you have a written goal, where you're like, I want to accomplish this during this amount of time and it is relevant to me because of this, that, and the other, and I wanna do it within three months. By having that type of goal, if a shiny penny comes along, you're able to look at that shiny penny and then compare it to your goal. Does this help you achieve that goal? If it doesn't, then let the shiny penny go right? If, if it doesn't help you to achieve the goal and objective that you've established for yourself, then it's not important and you can just ignore it. The other thing is, you know, if you have these goals, the other thing that you might have to do is stop paying attention to the shiny pennies. If you're feeling overwhelmed because of 
a YouTube channel that is telling you that you need to buy this and you need to buy that and this other thing is important every single day, every single week, maybe you stop watching that YouTube channel, right? Because you can't buy it all or you you unfollow that creator that is releasing, you know, all of these really awesome cover variants that you really like but don't help you to achieve the actual goal that you've set for yourself. Maybe you close out of Instagram. Maybe you don't go to that that uh, Facebook group because if you're going to be tempted by these things that are not allowing you to achieve your actual goal, then you have to stop tuning in to those things. And that's actually okay. It is actually okay to do that. Um, so there you go. Hopefully, hopefully that helps. Uh, Joker, and we have a couple more here. Uh, Joker is asking a question. He says, um, I have a comic with three signatures, but don't have a COA, a certificate of authenticity. I've been wanting to use CBCS's verified signature program, but I haven't decided on it yet. What's your opinion on that program? Have you ever used it or know someone that has? Do you think it's a waste of money and time on signing books that have not been witnessed? Or is there a better way to preserve the book as is? So if you were at this point in the video and you uh, watch my previous answer, you kind of sort of know what I'm about to say. And, and you do not have to get books graded. No one should make anyone feel like they have to get books graded. You can put an MIP sheet in that comic and you can put that comic in a Mylar and you can put it in a, in a, um, in a top loader. That is some great protection, right? The MIP sheets actually help to um, prevent the aging of books. It basically pulls out and releases some of the gases that come off of paper. These are the sheets that uh, CGC actually puts in their comics before encapsulation. There is a uh, discount code for MIP sheets on the partner page of ReggieCollects.com. Um, so you can use something like that along with Mylar and or a top loader, or you can honestly leave the comic in a poly bag and leave it in your bin. There's nothing wrong with these things, right? But if you do want to get the book graded, then you have to decide what services do you actually need. In this case, if you have books that have been signed, CGC will not give those books a yellow label because CGC only recognizes signatures that have been witnessed by a facilitator or by CGC or sent in by a creator themselves. That is the only way to get a yellow label. A book that has been signed, that is unwitnessed, even if you have a COA, will not get a yellow label from CGC. That's why uh, Joker is basically saying he wants to send this to CBCS. I have never used the signature verification service from CBCS. I know a lot of people have, a lot of people swear by it. Uh, so if you have these books that you wanna preserve, that you want to extract the value from, then do the verify signature. Send it to CBCS, let them verify the signature, and get, I think they will give you a yellow label. I think that they changed the color of their label from like red to maybe yellow, I think. Don't hold me to it because I don't pay a ton of attention to CBCS because I use CGC. Um, but that is not a bad way to go. Again, if you're trying to extract value, get the verify signature, don't send that signed book to CGC and get a green label if you're trying to do this for value. If you're trying to do it for preservation, you have a couple options, CBCS or Mylar or Top Loader or Polybag, all work perfectly fine. So I think that that answers all of those questions. Um, if not Joker, I'm sure you'll let me know. So the next two questions uh, from Mark and Yoshi really uh, deal with comic book pressing. So do you press bronze and silver age books differently than modern books due to the paper type and differences? I would think that newspaper type paper takes up the humidity and heat differently than the process you describe in your videos for a modern book. Uh, do the times in bath change and differ? Uh, Yoshi's question were, um, were around uh, pressing square bound books. So generally speaking, the press, the, the, the process for pressing a book is the same, generally the same. And if you watch the video series that I have, including the Q&A, it shows you the process. 
the the big differences if you will are the moisture bath time a modern comic does not require as much uh, moisture time because of the type of paper that uh, is used with modern books unlike older books they have newspaper print and those types of books take a little bit more moisture so that's one difference is the moisture bath but as I point out in those videos, you can kind of sort of tell when a book is ready to come out of the moisture bath because the paper will get a little wavy. It happens a little sooner with a modern book than it does an older book. But again, you're putting it in the moisture bath and you're paying attention to the book and you're removing it when the book is ready. So the process is the same. The time in which the book goes into uh, the press in terms of like the temperature and how long it's cooking is the same as demonstrated in the video. There is no difference there. Now, one change is that you typically wanna use a couple of more uh, Teflon sheets with a modern book versus a, an older book. The reason for that is that the, the uh, newer books have different paper, that paper is thinner, and if you don't have Teflon sheets or parchment paper or something like that and backing boards inside of that new book, you will get the pages stuck together because the inks and the paper are different. So as you see in the videos that I put out there, I use more of those things to basically slow the heat down so that the pages don't stick together. That doesn't necessarily happen with an older book. With an older book, you can put a, a, a Teflon sheet behind the front cover and a backing board in the middle and you can press that book and it'll be perfectly fine. With a, with a modern book, you may have to put six or seven different Teflon sheets in there behind the front cover and the back cover, a backing board in the middle, and then a few Teflon sheets spread throughout to slow that heat down or that book will flatten out like a pancake and the pages will also stick together. It'll be beautiful, but that's not necessarily the proper way to press one of those books. The amount of time that you leave it in the press after that is is this is pretty much the same. I mean, you leave it in there for eight hours, six hours, or a little bit long if you choose to, the book will be perfectly fine. So the process is the same, but you have to make these little tweaks. And I say that you have to make these tweaks because every single book is a little different. If you have a modern book that has the digital code in there, you have to do something different for it. If you have a square bound book, you have to do something different for it. If you have an oversized book, you do something different for it. If you have, you know, it, it, my point is that you're, it's a mixture of a process and a little bit of some art that has to go with it. The process itself is essentially the same regardless of the book. For a square bound book, to Yoshi's question, because of where the staples go with a square bound book, you oftentimes have to put a backing board or a Teflon sheet between the feet of that staple and the cover of the book, or else if you press it, the, the staples will puncture the paper. The process of the moisture bath, the cook time, the sheets is the same, but it's that art that you have to adjust for. The other thing with the square bound book that you have to pay attention to is that if you're pressing a modern uh, square bound book, or one that has glue, then you have to do a little something for that. You may need to turn down the temperature just a little bit for something like that because you don't want that glue at the spine of the book to heat up and then spill out of the edges. The challenge is not every square bound book has glue. So it's, it's again, the process is the same. You have to make these tweaks and adjustments based upon what you're pressing and how that book presents. If it has certain defects, you have to do it different. If it has digital codes, you do something different. The binding changes how you do it. So process same, make the adjustments. Hopefully that answers uh, Mark and Yoshi's questions and then maybe also answers someone else's question out there about pressing. There are, I want to say, uh, two videos on cleaning comics on the channel. There's also a four-part video on the channel that explains all of the tools and resources needed to press books and then the process to press. So there, And then there's a Q&A video. So there's a ton, a ton of content out there for you guys if you're looking to clean comics and press comics. And then on my website, reggiecollects.com, there's actually a full list of all the resources that you need to press comics with all of the links to Amazon so that you can get pretty much the exact same tools and setup 
that I use to press books as well. So hopefully this helps. With that, I'm going to wrap this video up. I want to thank everyone that actually submitted questions into me. And I don't know how many it was, but there were a lot of questions there. Hopefully I answered everyone's question. And depending upon how this video performs, maybe we will do another Q&A. If you guys need to reach out to me, feel free to do so on Instagram at Reggie Collects. Take care.